Shall we turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11? And I'm going to begin by reading verse 9. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart, and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things God will bring you to judgment. I think it's fair to say that Christians have always had something of a problem with pleasure and enjoying life. Things like dancing or drinking or smoking or gambling or parties. We have usually been seen as those who are against them. And too often we've been defined by what we don't do rather than what we do do. And so the world often sees us as being grey and boring and uninspiring. In fact, for many years, there has been a debate about whether Jesus himself ever laughed at all. You may have read Umberto Eco's book, The Name of the Rose. And in it, there's a debate between the different monks about whether Jesus laughed. One of them quotes John Chrysostom, who said that Christ never laughed. Another responds, nothing in human nature forbade it, because laughter is proper to man. And a third remarks, the Son of Man could laugh, but it's not written that he did so. Well, the truth is that whether Jesus laughed or not, he was incredibly good company, and people flocked to listen to him. If he was at a party, he was at the very centre of it. Everybody flocked to, to listen to him, to meet him, and to talk with him. Indeed, he had the reputation of being a party-goer, a wine bibber, and a glutton. He was accused of being at one stage. And I gather there is a website now entitled Jesus Laughing, www.jesuslaughing.com, which promotes a portrait of a heartily laughing Jesus and includes testimonials from people who have been helped by this image of a laughing rather than a sorrowful Christ. A bit of a stretch, perhaps, but it's still a reaction against the usual picture that people have. The fact is that there is a tension for us as Christians. On the one hand, life is an incredible gift. There is so much to enjoy and take pleasure in. And as Christians, we should never forget that. But at the same time, the world in which we live in is, is fallen. There's much evil and sadness in it. And how do we hold these two things together? Now, by this stage in the book of Ecclesiastes, one could be forgiven for thinking that the writer is something of a depressive. He is permanently gloomy. And none of us really appreciates that sort of person. They're lousy company. We like to be around people who are fun, who have a laugh. And so here the writer puts, as it were, the other side. He wants us to see the futility of life without God, but he also wants us to enjoy life. He wants to see that much of what we achieve in life is actually a bit of a waste of time. But also he wants us to see that what we do for God is never wasted. So what does he say in chapter 11? Three things. First, Make the most of every opportunity. We see that at the beginning, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Verse 6. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. It's a slightly curious mode of expression. But the writer is basically saying, push the boat out. Be prepared to take chances in life. Take a risk. Now we know that in the world of business, uh, you will never make a profit unless you're prepared to take a risk. And the writer is saying it's actually true to a degree in the Christian life as well. If we never step out of our comfort zone, if we never put our faith on the line, then we will never fully experience the true grace of God. Now this may be what we do with our money, how we use it. And some of the commentators think the primary meaning of these words is how we use our money. Be generous. If so, you will be rewarded. And it's a good biblical principle, isn't it? That the measure we give will be the measure we receive. Give and it will be given you. But surely it's not confined just to what we give. It's also about how we spend our time, what we do with our lives, when we talk to others about Christ, what we plan as a church, our hopes, the dreams we have for God's work. Are we prepared to step out in those situations because it's also easy to be so conservative that we never attempt anything instead we remain stuck in a rut because we can always find an excuse for not doing something it may be the uncertainty of life that holds us back the fear of failure look at verse 4 whoever watches the wind will not plant whoever looks at the clouds will not reap in other words if we spend our whole lives worrying about what will or will not happen we will never achieve anything, we'll never attempt anything, we'll never engage in mission or evangelism, we'll never give money to God's work, we'll hold on to what we have 
and not give to anything or anyone else. I always enjoy the story of a former Archbishop of Canterbury who was visiting a church in the countryside. And he met a man there who'd been church warden of that church for 52 years. And he said to him, you must have seen a lot of changes in that time. And the man said, yes, I have. And I've opposed every one of them. And I suspect most churches have that sort of person who hates all change, is frightened of risk. So the church never moves, never grows, and never develops. Instead, the writer urges us here, therefore, to take chances, to seize opportunities, to step out in faith. Yes, some things may not succeed. We may make mistakes. But that is the point. We don't know. And probably we won't know for a long time. That's the point of verse 6. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which one will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. You see, we don't know which will work and which will not. That's why we're called to step out. And if we're not prepared to step out, we won't grow. So the question I ask myself is this. What will it mean for us to step out in faith individually and as members of our church? What does it mean for us to cast our bread upon the waters? Where is God calling us to take a risk? That's the first thing. The second thing, live your life to the full, verses 7 to 10. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. You see, life is an incredible gift. And as such, it is given by, our, given by God to us to be enjoyed. Yes, there are trials. There are sadnesses. There are times when we find everything very hard to understand. And yet we are called to enjoy what God has given us. Christians are not meant to be miserable. There's not a Christian who once said, Jesus promised those who would follow him only three things, that they will be absurdly happy, entirely fearless, and always in trouble. Absurdly happy. I wonder if that describes us. Christians should, dare I say it, be the happiest people on earth. Not because we're deaf to the sufferings of the world, not because we don't care, but because through it all we know what life is about. We know who is the author and sustainer of life. We know that he loves us. He has our best interests at heart. And we know that one day we will be free from this world and we will live with him forever. See, we know that every day we have is a gift from God, a gift to be savoured, enjoyed and celebrated. Now one of the reasons I was first attracted to the Christian faith was the infectious joy and love of life of the Christians that I came to meet. They were quite simply the most attractive, the most kind, the most genuine people in my college. They had fun, they weren't killjoys, they weren't miserable, they lived life to the full. It's true they didn't sleep around, they weren't getting paralytically drunk every night. They weren't taking illegal drugs, as many people were. But they had fun, they enjoyed life, and they were different. And I wanted to know their secret. Why were they different? Was it something that I could have as well? And so the writer says, have fun, live life to the full. But of course there is a rider, a qualification in these verses, and that's the final point. Never forget the judgment. Verse 9b, follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things God will bring you to judgment. The king is not giving us a carte blanche to do whatever we want and to enjoy life in whatever way we want to behave. He's saying, yes, enjoy life, yes, have fun, but never forget that one day you will have to give an account for everything. All the way through the book, through the highs and the lows, the writer is never able to escape the presence and influence of his creator. The only meaning he can find is in that creator. Without him all is utterly meaningless. Life under the sun without God has no meaning at all. And one day we will meet with that creator. Every knee will bow before him. And what is more, we will have to give an account, each one of us, of everything that we've done and of how we've lived. It's the only thing that makes sense of life. Somebody put it like this. There is a judgment before us all, high or low, 
rich or poor, learned or unlearned. We shall all have to stand at the bar of God and receive our eternal sentence. We and God must at last meet face to face. We shall have to render an account of every privilege that was granted to us and every ray of light that we enjoyed. We shall find that to whomsoever much is given, of them much will be required. Let us remember this every day we live. So, those three things. Make the most of every opportunity. Live life to the full, but never forget the judgment. It's not a bad motto for life, isn't it? If we abided by that every day, we wouldn't go far wrong.